Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Um, so we're on the next step here of working on the furnace and uh, we've already covered pretty much building the base that's going on and the, the first step here in actually putting the, the high temperature refractory material in is to get the base uh, finished out again. And we've got this uh, ring around here and basically all we're going to do is just cast a, uh, the material in there, pour the material in there, level it off flush with the top and then the rest of the furnace will be built upon that. We'll have three inches of this high temp uh, refractory material in the bottom that will give us some insulation or should give us plenty of insulation uh, on the bottom of the furnace and uh, we'll probably add a little bit more uh, to the inside of the, of the, the where the crucible will go in uh, later on but first steps first here. So I thought I would go over a little bit of details on the refractory material that I'm using here uh, just simply because I know some people are going to be asking uh, questions so I try to uh, head some of these off with hopefully covering some of this. So uh, I, I, I talked to quite a few people and got a lot of input actually from folks on the channel about some refractory before I got too deep into this and a lot of people say well I just call around there's places you know about everywhere that you can buy the stuff from. Well I did a lot of searching and uh, they really couldn't find anybody close by me that could help me with this. I live in a pretty rural part of South Georgia. There's not a lot of industry in this area. It's more of an agricultural area. Uh, and because of that, there's really nobody who carried the stuff. Uh, there actually is a plant in Thomasville, Georgia, not too far from me, that makes refractory, but they don't sell it. Uh, they have to go through one of their distributors and all their distributors were so far off and the shipping was just going to kill me. So uh, uh, there were plenty of places in like up around Atlanta, Georgia, you get down into Florida, Tampa, Jacksonville, places like that, which aren't too terribly far away, but you know, it's, it's still, you know, three, four hour drive to get to some of those places. So uh, I got to look and I found a place in Birmingham, Alabama. And why Birmingham? I was actually going to be traveling through there with work. Uh, and uh, so I just swung into a place there and I, I called him up and talked to him first and then when I stopped by, visited with a, a man at the place, I think it was Thorpe Industries uh, was the, the name of the place that I, I bought this from and, uh, and this is a, one of the products that they sell and I'm sure you can get this in other places as well. But the name of this particular factory is Express 30 Plus. And uh, it is uh, rated to go up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and I've got their little tech sheet here. And, and um, for you metric guys, it's about 1,650 degrees Celsius, uh, since I can read it off the page and I don't have to do the conversion. Uh, but about 3,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is what this is rated to go up to, which is more than enough uh, to do what I want to do with this furnace. So uh, I plan on using it mostly for brass and aluminum, uh, but I may uh, attempt to try to do some cast iron in it at some point in time. So I wanted to go ahead and build it where it could withstand the temperatures needed to do cast iron, and uh, this should do it. So um, anyway, when I went to the refractory place that I got this, I sat down and, and the gentleman that I, that I was working with me has been in the business uh, selling this kind of materials for over 30 years, and he was a wealth of information for me and gave me a lot of tips. I told him exactly what I was wanting to do. I had a sketch of my furnace, and he basically said, yeah, this is gonna be the product that you wanna use for that. So a uh, couple of things. Uh, about it. It is a free flowing or self uh, flowing type of uh, castable refractory. Uh, it does not require uh, vibration to get it settled in there. So a lot of these materials you have to get a vibrator and kind of get the air bubbles out. You can do that with this and I may do it on some of the surfaces to kind of maybe get a smoother surface but it is not required. Uh, not required at all. So uh, and he said that, that would make it a lot easier uh, to use this particular one. Uh, and there's a whole process here on how to cure it and whatever once we get everything cast um, as far as uh, getting it up to temperature the first time. There's a whole process and he's giving me all the directions and so forth with that. But anyway, that's the material that we're using. All right, so we're going to mix this up uh, basically one bag at a time uh, throughout the process. Um, I had a long talk with a gentleman uh, that, where I purchased this from and he gave me a lot of really good tips for dealing with this refractory material. And one of the things that he strongly recommended that I do, he said to mix them up at a bag at a time or in batches that have a complete bag. He says you don't want to mix a partial bag. He said that when this product ships that you'll get some settling and basically the, the materials in the bag will separate uh, out naturally and you won't have a very uniform mix if you like just pour half a bag in. Uh, so for my purposes, he said ideally you'd use a cement mixer for this. 
don't have a cement mixer, really don't want to go rent one just for this quick job. So I'm going to mix it up in this bucket. Uh, I've got a pretty good sized bucket that should hold the, the entire material. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and put the entire contents into the bag or into the bucket. The instructions uh, that came with this and also what he told me was you need about, about half a gallon of water per 55 gallons. So we're gonna start by just pouring about half of this in there and uh, start mixing it up. That's good for right now. And to mix it, I'm using a, uh, one of these little stirrers, stirrers that's on a, on a good powerful drill. This is a, left over from a, uh, a tile project that I did for mixing up grout and it worked pretty good. So we're gonna try it out. Let's get some in here. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna to have to mix up another bag. Uh, and we'll go ahead and pack this down real good. We got some more mixed up here.
All right, guys, we're going to let that set up. So this has been setting up now for about 24 hours. Um, I poured this yesterday, and you can tell it's, it's, it's starting to dry. Now we've got a little bit of discoloration here, but that's just basically where the, it's drying out a little bit faster in some places than the other, uh, which is perfectly fine. I imagine when it's completely dry, we'll have a gray color all the way across it. Uh, but it's hard. Uh, it's sure it's not cured completely out yet, but uh, it's looking good, and uh, I'm very satisfied with the way this is. So give us a good foundation to build the rest of the furnace on top of. I also want to show you guys here uh, just how stable this new base is now with the expanded feet on there. So before you show, I showed you where I could very easily kind of tip it just by pushing on this corner, but now the, I can get up on here and stand, and you know it's 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 staying completely stable on the ground. And uh, when we pour, get the rest of this, yes, it will be higher, but most of the weight will actually be in closer to the center. And uh, it'll be uniform weight all the way around it. So I'm, I'm very happy with how stable this is now. I'm not worried one bit about this tipping over. Uh, it should be just fine. And the pallet jack works really good. I'll show you here. So I can come right in there, come up under this and uh, jack that up and now I can move it around with the pallet jack very easily. Um, I did have some comments from people saying, well, you know, you said you want to put this on sand or dirt and your pallet jack's not going to roll good across sand. Yeah, guys, I realize that. And the main reason I want to use the pallet jack though is really for more in the shop. So this is not going to be set up permanently in one place. I'll be moving it in and out. Um, we've got a tractor with forks on it. You know, we, once we get, kind of get it to the door, we can easily pick it up and set it wherever we want to uh, outside uh, on, on uneven ground. But the, really the whole purpose for the pallet jack is just being able to do exactly what I'm doing right here. So when we get in the shop and I need to tuck it over in a corner somewhere, we can come up with a pallet jack, pick it up and easily move it around. And uh, I know a lot of guys asked about the forks on the pallet jack. Uh, you know, why couldn't they be wider than they are? Well, this is how wide they are. They're not adjustable. They're fixed, um, and uh, you know what we got is what we got. This is pretty standard on pallet jacks. So I think that'll about wrap up uh, this edition. And uh, coming up next, uh, we're going to have to build some forms and uh, basically start building the actual chamber that the crucible will sit down inside of. There's a couple other things that's going to be involved in that process and uh, hopefully we'll have some time to work on this and continue this project right along uh, until we get it done. Uh, either way, we'll keep you guys uh, in the loop as uh, the furnace continues to get built and I appreciate you taking a look.